Uh, I'll get this, we'll get call the meeting to order for Labor and Industry Policy and Finance Committee for today, Thursday, March 16th. Um, uh, Representative Mecklen's not here, so Representative uh, what, uh, McDonald, my brain does not want to work. Did you get a chance to look at the minutes? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I did get a chance to look at the minutes. Um, and with that, I'd uh, make a motion to approve the minutes as written. Move, uh, Representative McDonald approve, moves to approve the minutes for March 14th. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The motion prevails. Uh, members, we first bill we have on the day is House Files 1625, Representative Herr. Good bill. And uh, it's good bill. You know. Welcome to the committee. Um, I'll move House File 1625, and my understanding that this is going to the General Register. That is correct, Mr. Chair. So I'll move it to be sent to the General Register. Um, Representative Her, and uh, there's an amendment here. Is this your amendment, or is this? Do you want to do the bill first and then the amendment, or? Um, let's go ahead with the amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay. Oh, there's an A4 amendment, and Representative McDonald, is this, I understand this is your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is my amendment. I'd like to move the amendment. Uh, Representative McDonald moves the A4 <coughs> amendment, and... Uh, Do you want me to explain it, Mr. Chair? Explain the amendment, please, yes. Uh, so my amendment is the uh, rebuttable uh, presumption of liability uh, on lines 1.13 and 1.1, line 6. So this puts the bill at odds with the rest of Minnesota Human Rights Act and federal and state law across the nation. My understanding is the Senate had already accepted this amendment. So this would be put in line with this. So what it does is operationally, as long as the rebuttable presumption of liability is in place, an employer who does everything right and receives pay history information only as a result of an employee's voluntary unsolicited disclosure can still be sued as a presumed wrongdoer. To avoid liability, the employer would have to prove a negative. That is, the employer would have to prove that it did not discriminate. And that would be very difficult, even for a full, fully compliant employer. It would result in an unjust liability for employers operating in good faith and who have an, an intent to comply with the law. So Representative Herr, if you should accept this friendly amendment, you would have great bipartisan support with your bill today. Representative Herr, what's your uh, pleasure? Mr. Chair and uh, Representative McDonald, I do see this as a friendly amendment. We have thoroughly discussed rebuttal presumption over the last biennium and this one, and um, I uh, would accept this. I would ask for a yes vote for this amendment, Mr. Chair. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I ask for a roll call. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yes. <yeah. laughs> you ask for a roll call? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, no, I, 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 I do not. Thank you, Representative Herr. You're welcome. And, and members, as much as it pains me to do something that the Senate does to go along with them. Um, um, all in favor of the A4 amendment to 1625, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails, the amendment's adopted. <laughs> Rep Representative Herr, if you want to explain the bill now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members, for hearing House File 1625. This bill is not a new bill, and um, many of you got to hear it last time debated as a standalone bill on the House floor. Um, this bill is coming before us again because it is a really important bill, and we absolutely should be passing this. Um, this bill made it through two committee stops and was heard, as a st like I said, as a standalone bill last year, and it passed it, um, on a bipartisan support of 80 to 51, which I assume now will be even higher bipartisan because we took up rebuttable presumption. But um, it is very straightforward, and it prevents an employer from asking uh, what a job applicant's pay history is when they're negotiating salary. And um, all the statistics tell us that women and people of color make lower uh, pay um, you know, for an equal job held by a, you know, a white man. And so when nothing against white men, it's just the stats, <laughs> statistics and data that tell us that. And when you disaggregate the data that Somali women and Hmong women make even lower than uh, women of Asian descent or of African American descent. And so it's really important for us to do this. And data are also tells us in the states that they have adopted this. We do see an increase in uh, a closing of the pay gap and um, you know I have a lot of comments that I that I have written up but I think that the best use of your time is to have Commissioner Lucero testify on this and we can answer any questions that you all may have thank you and I see you have a tester go and identify yourself for the record and proceed <coughs> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Lucero, and I'm the commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Thank you so much for having me. 
thank you, Representative Herr, for um, moving this bill over the past few years. Mm -hmm. It's exciting to be at this place that we're at right now. And so I just have a few comments about this bill that I want to make. First and foremost, this is a simple bill to follow for every employer, small or large. It simply says, don't ask about somebody's pay salary, because when you do, whether or not you mean to be, you're tying their salary to their previous salary, and you're a part of a system that, without meaning to, is leading to um, um, unequal, pay, unequal pay results. And so we need to look to close that gap. Um, um, the second thing about this bill is that it works, and Representative Herr mentioned that, but in states that have eliminated the pay history question, they saw an 8% increase for pay for all women and a 13% increase for pay in black workers. Um, um, the per it, it's been since 1963 that it has no longer been okay to pay men or women um, differently. However, that gender, um, that gender wage gap continues to exist even after passing the Equal Pay Act. Um, and in Minnesota, that gap has not narrowed over the past five years. And so you're not going to find an employer who says, yes, I want to pay men and women different. Um, if you do find that employer, let me know. But that doesn't exist. Men and women, uh, I'm sorry, employers say we want to pay men and women the same. And yet that gap continues to exist. And so we have to look at the structural reasons why that's happening. Um, and we have to come up with structural reasons to fix that, st structural solutions to fix that. This is one of those structural solutions. It's so easy. Um, and, it, and it will have quick, easy results. Um, and so we are ready to do education and outreach to all employers of all sizes to just train them the exact same way you say you don't ask people if they're pregnant is the exact same way you don't ask them a previous salary um, to make this decision. Um, and so we can implement this very quickly in Minnesota um, to make it easy to comply with. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of support that exists for this bill that includes the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, Mid Men Legal Aid, Latino Lead, the Girl Scouts of River Valley, all of whom understand that Minnesota thrives when women thrive. That includes women of color, trans women, women with disabilities, when all are compensated based on their skill, experience, and education. So our department is excited to support this bill to bring Minnesota one step closer to closing the pay gap. And we appreciate the support and we appreciate the bipartisan support for this important bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. And is there anybody else in the audience that wishes to speak for or against this bill? If not, member questions. <clears throat> Seeing no hands jumping up, Representative Hurd, looks like you're going to get off early easy today. <laughs> if you want to do a wrap up on your bill, and, I'll, yes. and then I'll renew the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee, for hearing this bill. I know there, I used to say a lot more when it came to this bill, but I think I feel like um, everyone understands the importance of this. Um, I would just like to share a really quick story before I conclude, since we do have a little bit of extra time, in that, um, you know, I, you know, but last year I was working with somebody who had been um, looking for a job, and, and he hadn't looked for a job in a really long time. And... Um, and actually in 20 years he hadn't been looking for a job and so he thought he would call um, his HR company to find his HR of his old company to say like what are the questions that you ask or what do people ask when they call you to ask for verification and they told him that they provide his pay information to the new employer and he said I thought that that was private information I thought that we weren't supposed to share pay because I come from the private sector they used to always tell us like you couldn't tell people how much you were making I think that was their way of ensuring that we wouldn't know who was making more and he said well and he said that this very when he asked his employer like is this common practice they said you know it depends on the company but they said they do it to protect themselves I don't know what from but he just thought oh my gosh so if somebody makes less money Money, then they're going to be locked in that because an employer is already telling other people what you're making and and you don't know what you're competing up against and I just think that you know when we do um, you know when we actually look at people's qualifications and we actually look at you know the, what they bring to the table and, and um, the experience that they have that that's what we should be basing their pay on and eliminating the pay history question and eliminating that pay um, you know barrier up front allows us to be able to do that and so um, you know I would love to see Minnesota join the ranks of the 18 other states that have done this and for us to see the impact that that will have once we're able to pass it too. So I ask for this committee support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Herr. Um, <laughs> Representative McDonald's, can we send it to the consent calendar or I will just, <laughs> we'll send it to the general. I'll renew my motion that House File 1625 amended be re referred to the general register. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The bill's on its way. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. I know. This, this leaves them more time. Our next bill is House File 1831. <laughs> Representative Greenman. 
And, and I'm just going to check, check my here to make sure I'm right, but this go, is going to uh, judiciary. Judiciary. Do you want to make the motion then? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd move that House Fell 1831 be re-referred re uh, re re to Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Thank you. I'll um, want to explain your bill, Representative Freeman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm hoping that the extra time uh, gives us an opportunity to uh, uh, to engage in why, why this is such an important bill. Um, I am really grateful to be able to present the House Fell 1831. It's a bill that will protect workers by prohibiting no poach provisions in franchise agreements. For those not familiar with no poach agreements, they're also called no hire clauses. They're agreements reached between employers to not recruit or hire each other's workers. In the fran franchise context, they're agreements where the franchisees of the same company agree not to hire each other's workers. For example, for many years, these agreements precluded Jimmy John's franchisees from hiring each other's sandwich makers. So let's say you work at a Jimmy John's in Minneapolis and you hear that a Jimmy John's in St. Paul offers a better schedule, higher wages, and is hiring. You submit your application uh, listing your relevant experience as a sandwich maker in Minneapolis. Under these no approach agreements, the St. Paul Jimmy John's won't hire you without explicit permission from their current employer in Minneapolis. And worst of all, you may never know why you didn't get that job. These agreements limit the job options of Minnesota workers. And what's most troubling is that these agreements are, are, are made above the head of the workers. These workers never see or sign them, but they can be turned away from a job because of them. These agreements have been common in the fr franchise context, and they have a detrimental effect on, on workers' earnings. In 2016, it was estimated that approximately 60% of franchisees had these agreements in place. Um, and when lit well, litigation in, in efforts in some parts of the country to use, um, to eliminate these restraints on employment uh, have led to some franchisors stopping to use these clause. Others have not, and this remains a problem. It's important here in Minnesota to draw a clear line in the statute that these restrictive employment clauses are prohibited, and that's what this bill does. It protects workers by making it clear that these agreements are prohibited and requiring franchisors to remove these restrictive employment provisions from their contracts. These agreements, these no hire, no poach agreements, are unfair to workers, they restrain the free market flow of labor, and they should be prohibited. And with that, Mr. Chair, I believe we have a testifier sitting right behind me. Testifier listed here, uh, Aaron Sojourner. I probably butchered the last name, but. You did great. You did great. No problem. Um, if you want to identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, I'm Aaron Sojourner. I'm a labor economist. I study institutions in the labor market, like employment contracts and restrictions, how they affect wages and mobility. Uh, for 13 years, I was a professor at the University of Minnesota Carlson School of Management. Um, I spent a year working at the White House Council of Economic Advisors as senior economist for labor in the Obama and in the Trump administrations. Um, and now I work for the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research, which is a nonpartisan um, institute focused on how labor markets work. So I want to thank you all for your work on this important issue about no poach franchise agreements um, and the chance to share what economists have learned in recent years. There's been kind of an explosion of, of research and evidence that have come to light in recent years about this issue. And it does show that uh, collusive agreements like this suppress wages and limit employee freedom. So uh, Representative Greenman uh, gave you a good overview, just hammer some of those points home. So what is a no poach agreement? We're talking about agreement between two organizations, uh, in this case between the franchisee and the franchisor. Uh, and like here's an example from a, Sabar a Sabaro, like the Italian fast food place, right? Uh, developer, the, the franchisee covenants that during the term of the, co of the agreement, except as otherwise approved in writing by Sabaro, the franchisor, developer shall not knowingly employ or seek to employ any person who is at th that time employed or during the six months period prior to such time was employed by Sabaro, corporate, or 
by any licensee of Sabaro. So basically it's saying in order to get a franchise as a small business person, I have to make this agreement with Sabaro corporate and I have to promise not to hire or seek to hire any other employee of any other Sabaro uh, franchisee. Um, and I can be assured that all the other franchisees will not try to hire or seek to hire my employees as well. So it's a way of coordinating uh, and colluding together to suppress labor market competition between employers. Um, it runs through the franchisor. Uh, in 2016, it came to light from some research that you can see in the, in the back of my testimony by Ashenfelter and Kruger that uh, these kinds of restrictions were really common. They were in 58% of major franchise filings had these kind of agreements, including big names like Amco, uh, Transmission, Burger King, Buffalo Wild Wings, H&R Block, uh, Sport Clips, Hair Salon. Like this is quite widespread. Um, and that was up from 36%, you know, 20 years before. So it, it's been a growing phenomenon. What do they do? We already talked about it. Basically, it is a way for the employers to collude together, to limit the freedom of employees, to change jobs and seek better op job opportunities. Uh, it limits wage competition and limits employees' job options. This is really an anti-competitive practice designed to suppress labor compensation and boost profits for the uh, employer. Why should we be concerned about it? Well, it operates without workers' consent. They are not party to these agreements, but they are affected by these agreements. So it may seem easy for a franchise worker to go down the road and find another job, but in these case, you know, the agreement takes away the ability for them to do that, to seek employment with precisely the employers who they're most qualified to work for, where they have the most relevant skills. So, you know, the, imagine, you know, take a Sabaro worker, you know, maybe something changed in their life. Maybe their kid has to go to a new school. Maybe their aging parent needs a little more help day to day. So they want to get a job in a different location. They want to find a job closer to that school or that parent's house. Uh, so they go apply to a Sabaro closer to there because that's where they have experience. That's what they know how to do well. Again, uh, their application, they're going to write down, I work at Sabaro. It's just going to get thrown in the trash. And that opportunity is not available to them. Um, you know, so what, what's the impact on workers? After these, uh, in 2016, after these, the widespread extent of these collusive agreements came to light, the Washington State Attorney General cracked down. They went to a bunch of these franchisors and they said, you have to stop this. And a bunch of them did stop in Washington state. And um, economists studied what happened after that. And what they saw was that wages rose 4% faster in the chains that were using these agreements compared to the chains that weren't using these agreements. 4%, that sounds small, but you know the median uh, worker in these companies makes about $26,000 a year. So that's about $1,000 a year of wages that they got after the Attorney General stopped this uh, kind of restrictive collusion. And there was another case in Silicon Valley that was pretty high profile, pretty famous. Intel, Apple, Google. This was not like a franchise or thing. This was just employers directly colluding. Uh, and when after that came to light, the agreement fell apart. The Department of Justice came in and said, this is illegal under the Sherman Act. This is a violation of, of uh, federal antitrust law. And we saw, again, a, a different set of, a different researcher did a study and saw that wages rose 2.5% faster in those companies compared to similar companies. So what this research shows is that employer competition can be fragile. Employers can profit by not competing hard against each other for talent, and you know workers pay the cost for that. Um, you know, one thing that is worth mentioning is that sometimes employers will say, "Look, these things are justified because we need to protect the investments we made in workers, 
for. We have a really hard time retaining workers, but I would urge you to be skeptical about these kind of arguments because the first thing is there's no reason to take away opportunities from workers that they're best suited for, especially without their knowledge. An employer can enter into an agreement with a worker to say, I want to give you this training, but I don't want you to run away with it. So if you take this training and then you quickly leave, you have to pay back some of the costs of that training. So if you want to protect your training investments, make that agreement directly with the worker. Don't go above the worker's head and collude with another employer. The second thing is, like, if you have trouble hanging on to your workers, maybe you can just pay them better or improve working conditions. Like, uh, that's a, an acceptable thing to do in a competitive market. Um, but conspiring with other employers is not a pro-competitive practice. That's an anti-competitive practice. Um, so there's this little loophole in the law. I told you the Department of Justice said, told the Silicon Valley employers this is a violation of the Sherman Act to collude directly. But, but because franchisees are contracting with a franchise or this is kind of a legal gray area. And what this bill would do is basically close that loophole and bring uh, this Minnesota law into compliance and into alignment with sort of federal law as it pertains to um, employer to employer collusion. Thank you for your time. Happy to try to answer any questions. Anybody else that wants to speak for or against this bill? Otherwise, member questions. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Greenman. Um, my question for you is, is, is to the definitions. And, um, and, and for me, I'm an independent contractor, and I wanted to kind of understand, uh, and for the public to understand here that might be tuning into this conversation, why does it include independent contractors in the employee definition found on page 2, line 2.6? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Representative Schultz. Um, it includes independent contractors because the, the uh, philosophy is the same, which is and it, whether you're an employee or whether you've been contracted with the franchisee, you should not have, you should not, your uh, mobility to another uh, uh, franchisee shouldn't be restricted by an agreement that you're not party to. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Greenman. Uh, specifically talking about independent contractors. Is that something that we see where, where is that seen a lot in this? So at the, basically at the problem that you're seeking to, to, to fix here, um, is that something with independent contractors that is seen often? Um, my concern with this language is that it, that then creates an opening for the language to just be a little bit too broad for what we may want to accomplish. Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Schultz. I'm not sure how it broadens uh, uh, the agreement or the, the language, because the language, all it says is that uh, franchisors can't have a no hire, a no poach agreement that relates to the people they employ, or in this case, the people they're contracting. I will say, um, I think it's necessary, because I think one of the things that we've seen across the economy is the increased use of uh, independent contractors. And what we don't want to do is create a loophole that says you can use an independent contractor and you can restrict their mobility. And in some cases, you would imagine that their mobility um, should be even less restrictive. Um, and so this just makes sure that we're applying the standard to any person uh, who potentially would be employed or in that case contracted with the franchisee. Representative Schultz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Grumman. Uh, how does, how would this bill, how is it, how would it interfere with basic contract law? Representative Grumman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't think it would um, because one, what we're doing is um, like our non-discrimination agreements, like any other things, we're putting into law a, a clear line. But what I would also say, and I just want to highlight it, um, in the context of not a franchise context, these provisions, so if, if, Apple and Google or Sabaro and Jimmy John's got together and said we won't hire each other's workers, it's pretty clear in law that that would be a violation of federal antitrust law. 
And so what we're talking about is a legal gray area that I think very, in some cases, have gone to court and actually been found to be an unenforceable contract provision anyways. And so I think that the, the thing that I'm worried about is um, that we will have provisions in contracts that employees don't know about. Mm -hmm. And so ca they can't enforce their rights even if we have courts that say they're unenforceable. So I, as a, as a lawyer who did a lot with contracts, I'm not worried about this uh, interfering with the ability of folks to contract because I think what we're trying to do is create a clear line around uh, um, a legal uh, relationship that in antitrust law is pretty clear. Representative Schultz. I just say thank you. I, I know that you're far more an expert on this particular area of law than I am, So, but I do appreciate the answers to the questions. Represent, Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Greenman, I think this could be yet another bipartisan bill. Uh, but question, uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan? Bipartisan. Yeah. Bipartisan. bipartisan, yeah. Bipartisan. Thank you. Bipartisan. I have something else on my mind. It's a green, <laughs> if you want to guess. No, um, so the question is, uh, 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 two questions. The subcontractor or the independent contractor, <laughs> is there any such thing for uh, some of the scenarios you gave us, such as Jimmy John's and Sabaros and McDonald's, I'm surprised you didn't say that name, but uh, is there anything that uh, in that industry that would be described, that employee would be described as an independent contractor? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Representative, uh, or thank you, cha the Chair and Representative McDonald. And I don't want to get out on my, over ahead of my skis, um, but um, I can imagine that you have a cleaning company or a cleaner who is independently contracted with a, uh, uh, um, to clean at night. Right? And you have a relationship, and I'm looking at Aaron. <laughs> um, you have a relationship that may not be an employment relationship, but may be a, a, a legitimate independent contractor relationship. If you have in your franchisor and franchisee agreement this no poach agreement, and we don't pass a law that includes them, you could still have a valid no hire agreement, I think, um, uh, that says that the Sabaros down the street can't hire that independent contractor to do their cleaning work either, right? So what this is doing is I think it's saying it is not about the employment relationship. Again, this is um, a, a bill that impacts an agreement that's happening above the head of whether it's the independent contractor or the employee. It's happening above their head. And so in, by including independent contractors and employees, what we're saying is it should not be okay for there to be a contract about you and your work that you can't go and work for another company um, uh, in, the, in that franchisor contract. And let me, uh, I think I see my test of tire chopping at the bit, so maybe Mr. Sojourner has some more to say. Mr. Sojourner. I, I would just say, uh, echo Representative Greenman's point mm -hmm. that um, it's very common for employers to um, misclassify employees as contractors as a way to avoid um, labor regulation uh, to avoid UI payments, workers' comp payments, minimum wage, overtime. Um, like, so there definitely are legitimate independent contractors who work for many different clients, who go out and bid for work, and who control their tools and their technologies and their pace of their work. This isn't moving in that direction. This is two potential employers who are saying, we're gonna limit the independent contractor's ability to bid for independent work. This is making them into dependent contractors. You know, this is making them, restricting their ability to compete. So making them more like employees. Those agreements are doing, would be doing that. So preventing that from happening seems like it would benefit independent contractors as well. Again, an independent contractor who wanted to have an exclusive relationship with a franchisee, that could be negotiated between the franchisee and the independent contractor, and they could say, you'll only work for me, you won't work for these other franchisees, but then you could ask for some compensation for that. And you could say, like, me giving up that right is valuable to me. I, I'm losing an earning opportunity. So if that's important to you, let's do that. But let's make sure that we're doing it with our eyes open. Uh, going over my head, you know, that's that's not open and fair. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With the greatest degree of respect 
for your answer. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked Representative Greenman's answer. It was more clear. <laughs> <laughs> no offense. She, she's the politician. <laughs> yeah. 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 uh, academic. Some ways that's surprising in all, all in itself. Anyway. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Chair. So Representative Greenman, I support the bill. I think we're just concerned that it doesn't change the definition of an employee in current state law in that chapter that you have in thank section two. So that would be a concern of all of ours, I'm sure. Representative Greenman. Mr. Chair, um, thank you, Representative McDonald. This does not just wait for my misclassification bill. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, in all seriousness, this does not uh, impact or change. What it does is say we're going to cover all the, the, um, uh, the potential uh, folks who would be employed or contracted with that franchisor. And Mr. Chair, one last follow up. Okay, Representative McDonald. Thank you. Know. Just quickly, uh, does, is this happening often? I mean, I, I get the bill. I certainly, uh, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, uh, but does this happen often? I perhaps. Representative McDonald, uh, Greenman. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this has been helpful. I've been listening to Mr. Sojourner. There's a, a professor out of Maryland, uh, uh, um, Evan Starr, who's an expert on this. What they said, and the reason that the 2006, 60% of franchisors, uh, franchise agreements had clauses like this. What has been good, and I'd say is with the transparency around this, there have been both big franchisors who've said we're not going to do this anymore, um, and there's been some litigation. I think the reason we should get involved as we create a clear standard and don't wait for the courts or don't wait for it. The other thing I say that I think is really important is sometimes we don't know because again we're talking about contracts that are above the heads of workers and so what the clause is in a franchise or, uh, or franchisee agreement is sometimes hard to get a handle on the size of the problem but 60% in 2016 had agreements like that. Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Nelson and uh, Representative Greenman for this bill. And also that set me up great for my next question. So I'm sitting here thinking, I work my way through high school and college working at a lot of fast food restaurants. And, you know, it strikes me that a lot of times we say, well, if you don't like, you know, your place of employment, go find another one, whether it be pay or conditions or whatever. And working my way, th and yes, I do make a darn good Big Mac, if anybody's wondering, <laughs> <laughs> and French fries. Yeah. Um, but I, it strikes me that within this context of maybe not having the consent and not having that autonomy on you, you might want to change for a shift, or you might want to, right, for lots of different reasons, pay raise, better opportunity. Um, and you might not even know that this is happening, and I'm just thinking of many examples um, that I didn't even know at the time. Uh, and so could you just help us understand that, so this would be on the books, but then how does, as an employee, have the autonomy and the, you know, empowered with the knowledge and then action to make sure that um, I'm not missing out on opportunities to be able to, to grow and um, go on because this is happening without my knowledge. Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and that's um, and Representative Kosowski, and I think that you have identified exactly the problem, which is you could have applied to another McDonald's and not been given a job, and it might have been some place where you could make a dollar more an hour, and um, and you just didn't get the job, like we all don't get jobs sometimes, and it was because of this agreement. So the two things that this does, one, by by creating a clear line that not just is it unenforceable, but you have to take it out of the contracts. So franchise contracts can't have this language anymore. Um, so there's no language, that's really important. It also adds um, to, the, to Dolly um, the ability to just enforce this like they enforce other provisions. So there's some enforcement provision. I will say, and we've been having the conversation around other restrictive employment agreements like non-competes and other things, the reason it's so important to take them out of the contract, even if, uh, legally they've been found unenforceable is because we know when that contract language is around um, it still affects and sometimes people follow it and so we want it out of the contract um, we want to make sure that that workers um, uh, have and can have all the opportunities and in this labor market if there's a McDonald's paying a couple more bucks an hour like that's someplace you want to work at you should be able to go work there so I really appreciate the question and, and the uh, opportunity to clarify Representative Representative Schultz, one last question, and we'll get then we'll get to the vote. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I look forward to finding the, that Big Mac that Representative Lusky <laughs> makes. Um, uh, but uh, to Representative Greenman, um, looking at this bill, um, I, like uh, Representative McDonald, uh, am inclined to support this bill. Um, but my question for you is, what protections do franchisers have should a franchisee hiring or soliciting practices infringe on trade secrets, customers lists, client solicitation, and other proprietary um, information, functions, operations, technology, et cetera. Representative Greenman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'll highlight a, a few things that I think that um, uh, Mr. Sojourner said, but we actually have legal protections for all of those things, right? So that is, a, if, if you're worried about trade secrets, there are legal protections around those trade secrets that are not about the employee's ability to move, but what they can and can't bring with them and share. So. Uh, this doesn't do anything to, to uh, affect trade secrets uh, uh, provisions that you can put in your bill. When we talk about, and, and when we talk about, I think one of the things that particularly in franchise workers, and we're talking about uh, um, service workers, is you know if you're worried about in doing a lot of investment uh, in training and other things, like there are provisions that can be negotiated that can say, if you leave after two weeks, you have to repay that training. So there's a lot of, and to your point, and I'm glad you brought that up, because those are a more direct way of protecting the employer's interest, the franchisor's interest, which is in the information that might be proprietary, which is in the investments that they want to make in folks. We None of this changes that. This says these restrictive employment agreements are not the way to do it, because what they're doing is they're actually impacting, and what they're really about is, I would say, uh, anti-competitive uh, um, uh, Collusion, but even if you don't, if you if you say what your real goal is is protecting trade secrets, then use the trade secret uh, law and rules, not um, this this employment restriction. Yeah, Representative Grieven, if you want to do a wrap up and then renew your motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, members, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. I think most folks don't actually know uh, this is going on, and so I, I watched the Senate hearing too, and I think the opportunity to actually talk about it, I think, uh, to to um, to Representative Koslowski's points, to, to uh, Representative Schultz and McDonald, I think we all um, agree and probably want to make sure that workers can take their labor and go out and make a wage um, and not have a relationship or a, a, an agreement above their head uh, get in the way of that. And so when we talk about 4% wage, uh, uh, a wage penalty, I would say, for for, for these kind of contracts, um, this is a really good and relatively simple way to prevent that from happening in a way that I think we can stand up for um, the rights of workers and, and the free market and, and a com uncompetitive labor market. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would ask for your support. And Representative and oh. re renews her motion that House File 1831 is referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The bill's on its way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's make this. Members, our final bill today is House File 2687 from Chair Nelson. Chair Nelson, please move and explain your bill. Uh, I'll move House File 2687, and we're going to lay it over at the end of the hearing today. Um, there's been some developments, and, and, and so we're going to get an amendment drafted to fix the things that have been brought up. Um, the things would all happen at the last minute here. So, But um, members, House File 2687 is about, there's an overlap in work between two different groups of people, two different traits that uh, have to do with elevators and conveyors and the, and the such. Um, and this... This, this bill I've had for two years ago, I put this bill in, and we thought we had an agreement. We actually did have an agreement. It was the language that of the bill that I drafted this year was the language that was agreed upon, was in Representative um, Eklund's bill, uh, omnibus bill last year. And so we went to put the, put the back in to get this, get this done. Um, it just, but the bill does, it seeks to clarify the language. 
that came out of that agreement from last year and between the elevator operators and the mill rates. Um, the language was, like I said, was agreed upon last year and of the issues that have come up and, uh, and they I was just told right before the, meet, the meeting here or the, the committee meeting that they've come to an agreement on language, what to do. We'll work on an amendment with, with James after this and, and when we bring the bill back, we'll amend it to deal with that. I also got an email early today from the electricians and they had had issue in about where it talks about in the bill it says contractors uh, yeah, where it says on line 2.4 to 2.5 contractors need to withhold or a license under this section and they have concerns that that may be too broad. They want to just add or talk about just this section. So we're going to get an amendment to deal with those two things and that's the bill. Like I said, it's to deal with, it goes back to when it started out of, everybody knows seeing the Carvana commercials with the tall structures they have that move cars around and you come up and you buy your car and you punch a code in and it brings your new car down to you. Um, some people call them car gumball machines. Um, that's what this came out of. Because some of that work that, that deals with that crosses the line between what millwrights do with conveyors and, and what elevator operators do. So with that, ma Madam Chair, um, I think there's a couple people that want to testify and uh, go from there. Thank you, Chair Nelson. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify? Welcome, Mr. Dunnick. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, good, a uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Labor Committee. Good to see you all, all today, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative Nelson, for carrying this bill. Uh, just not to add too much to what Mr. Nelson here just said is we've been working on this bill for a couple of years. It came to us by way of kind of understanding how uh, some different new technologies were emerging around parking automatic uh, car parking systems working into, into uh, underground garages. And in some states, millwrights perform that work. In Minnesota, we are not allowed to because of the elevator constructor, constructor's license. And long story short, we worked with them on some other ideas around the licensing issues of some issues around conveyors that are, is work that our members do that we believe uh, doesn't require a license. We got almost all the way to an agreement. There is one uh, thing in this bill that we'd like to make a change and that will work with, uh, with them on making that change and with the author. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. And it's good to be on, work on a bill where there's a lot of agreement on it. Thank you. And could you state your name for the record? Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Uh, Adam Dunnick with the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other testifiers? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair and members. My name is Amos Briggs with Lockridge Grindle Nowen here on behalf of the Union Elevator Constructors. I um, want to first thank Chair Nelson and the other stakeholders for their work on this bill over, as, as the Chair said, over a few years, and especially for the continuing conversations in the last few days. Uh, we are pleased to have an agreement uh, here today uh, with the change to exclude vertical reciprocating conveyors in line 2.6 of the bill. Uh, the elevator constructors are good with this bill uh, language moving forward. And uh, again, appreciate the uh, continued work that will happen this session. So thank you. <coughs> thank you. Discussion to the bill members? Lead McDonald. Madam Chair, Representative Chairman Nelson, I just can't believe you'd bring this bill to the floor. Outrageous <laughs> to this committee. Outrageously good bill that we can't vote on. It's very disappointing. I hope this bill doesn't go all the way to the top. <laughs> too quickly and you get this all worked out so uh, no no it reminds me of a bill my first bill back in 2011 it had to do with non-emergency medical transportation thanks to representative senator abler I changed the word from must to shall or shall to must oh the whole world was gonna end you'd think I was a young buck didn't know what I was doing and uh, thought well it's an easy bill shall to must or they came out of the woodwork my elevator was rung, let me tell you that. <laughs> and uh, so I get the feel, I know the feeling of uh, some things just don't work out and they need to be amended. So uh, I thank you for bringing this bill and that's all I had to say to you. Thank you, Chair McDonald, and uh, save your dad jokes for your own time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, we love them. Oh. <laughs> Any further discussion? It's kind of hard to follow that. Chair Nelson, would you like to uh, make closing comments? 
Um, like I said, we've been working on this for a couple of years. We, we had an agreement last year. Yeah. Um, this is just basically tweaking that agreement from last year, and uh, I will get the amendment drafted uh, with Ms. With, with, with Ms. James, and we'll bring this back next week and get it passed and out of committee. And it may show up in an omnibus bill also. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nelson. House file 2687 is laid over. Seeing no further business before the committee, our next hearing will be held Tuesday, March 21st. <laughs> Thank you.